So now we'll talk a little bit more specifics about the disc. It doesn't have very much vascularity. There's no blood vessels inside the disc. The way that it gets its nutrition is diffusion across the end plates. All right, so are you going to get more better diffusion and nutrition in and out of the discs if your discs and joints are moving versus if they're not moving? Yeah, so motion and exercise is good to help the discs. And then also you might have seen those big therapy balls, the gym balls are they call them. You know, you, the, a lot of times people will use those as a chair. You know, you can sit on those and, and bounce. And what that's doing is it's pumping your disc that helps to uh, exchange nutrients in and out of the disc. Uh, now there's some free nerve endings and there's mechanical receptors because you have these nerve roots coming out they send nerve branches and we're not going to get into too much of the neurology but just understand that some of those nerve roots send branches to the facet joints and also to the, the, the disc and then this posterior longitudinal ligament it's stronger in the center and it's weaker to the outside so is that disc going to herniate right here or is it going to sneak around the outside? Yeah, right. So usually you have posterior lateral disc herniations. You can have central right here, but usually that posterior longitudinal ligament is going to deter that, so it's going to come over to the side here. And also the disc, as it gets towards the back part of the disc, the annular fibers are stretched a little bit more, so that's why the disc is going to tend to, to herniate posteriorly versus anteriorly. So then again, we talked about the forces on the disc, and then this one, basically it's the combined one that's going to be causing the problems. Because you have, most of the time, somebody, people are going to come in, if they come to see for low back pain, they're going to say, well, all I was doing was just lifting up a pencil that I dropped, but I, you know, went like this. Because sometimes they'll think, okay, I'm lifting this heavy box, I better make sure and do my good biomechanics. When they get stuck, as they go and do something like that, and then, you know, they're like this. And they come in like this. <coughs> Let me go back a second. As you can see, as it's as the disc is rotated like that, and it gets that shearing effect, that's how you're getting tearing of the annular fibers from just that shearing and rotation of these combined forces. How do you treat it? Well, it depends on what. It, Depends what it is. I mean, you can you kind of do an examination, find out it's facet. I mean, sure, if somebody has a full-blown disc herniation and they're getting you know, what we call the red flags of sound paresthesia, bowel, loss of bowel and bladder control, you send them to the emergency room for surgery. Or if it's a facet problem, you know, obviously if I'm, I'm a chiropractor, I'm going to do adjustments to the facet joints. And, you know, you can do that function. It depends what the problem is. You know, it's like it's like saying. Uh, when you take your car to the shop, what do they do? Well, you find out what's wrong and then you fix what's wrong. But it's like we were talking about before, it's not, there's different things you can do. You can do traction, there's different types of things. If it's a mechanical type of pain, you know, if it's disc compression, you want to do things to relieve disc compression. So you do traction, different things. Okay, so then in general sense, we have lumbar range of motion. As you extend, what happens to the disc? It moves forward. As you flex, the disc moves back. As you flex forward, what happens to the facet joints? They get opened and stretched. So which is going to stretch, your, which is going to evaluate the joint capsule of the facet joint? Flexing forward or standing back? Like if somebody tore the joint capsule, get evaluated by stretching it, so that's going to be flexion. Whereas if there's issues of irritation of the set joints, you're going to do extension. All right, then we talked about look, loose pack position is kind of midway between flexion and extension. Uh, like most of the time, loose pack positions are going to be anatomical position. And then close pack position when we talk about close pack, we're talking about joints. So which is going to put the joints in max maximum compression? Bending back like that. I would almost say more specifically to the each facet joint is to extend and laterally flex towards that side and rotate towards that side. Because that's going to give you that maximum 
closed pack position on that particular facet joint. And then capsule pattern is going to be an equal limitation between um, lateral flexion and rotation. And then again, we talked about lumbopelvic rhythm. So as you bend forward, what happens first? <coughs> Lumbar flexion, and then it's followed by movement of the sacrum. And then what happens in the in reverse? Yeah. You should normally do pelvic tilt, and then return of the normal lumbar extension. So if somebody has that rhythm reversed, and I think I've got some slides of that before, it's going to be more, put more pressure on the facets. If somebody has hypertonic lumbar extensors, they go to bend like that, the first thing that happens is they increase their lordosis, that's going to be more pr prone to having problems versus the normal rhythm. So again, here's the normal lumbar pelvic rhythm coming back up. First, you want to reverse that pelvic, uh, or do a pelvic tilt, which is moving back like this, and then return of the normal lordosis. <clears throat> all right, so then we have a lot of ligaments in the spine. Those are all in the notes. We talked about anterior longitudinal pons, posterior longitudinal. Then you have intertransverse, interspinous, supraspinous. And again, ligaments, they're going to connect bone to bone, right? Inner tissue, posterior longitudinal, supraspinous. Then you have the facet joint capsule. So this is talking about the actual lumbar facets. Now we're getting into contractile tissue. All right, so here you can see here's the, what's this right here? That's the disc. Okay, so what muscle is going to be right there? So that's right. If you, if you look at, if you divide here, remember here's between the anterior motor unit and posterior motor unit. On the front are going to be flexor muscles, on the back are going to be extensor muscles, and then you'll have some kind of in, in that in-between layer. So then here, this is what you have the erector spine muscles. Okay. So you have the di different layers. When you're starting superficial to deep, we have the erector spine muscles. You start getting into here, you're getting into the multifidi muscles. And then you get into the deep ones, they have the intrinsics, like the, the small rotator muscles. Right, so those are going to be more closer to the spine. Those are the extensors. So then on the front, we're going to have the flexors. So you have the iliopsoas here, which is there. And then you're going to have the different abdominal muscles, right? What's this here? Rectus abdominis is going to be flexor. <coughs> then you're going to have the internal obliques, external obliques, right? transversus abdominis, those are going to do some of the lateral flexion and rotation, things like that. <coughs> See, when you sneeze like that, it increases all that abdominal pressure, right? All your muscles contract. Okay, so you have, like I say, internal external obliques. And then, kind of in this area here, you have the quadratus lumborum. And that's the only one that's a pure, pure lateral flexor. If you remember on the quadratus lumborum, you have the, you know, the spinous process, you have the ribs here, and you have the, the neck crest. You have some fibers that go this way, and some fibers that go that way, and then some that go up and down like that. that that's all that you have? What's that? That's all that one muscle? Yeah, quadratus lumborum. Okay, there's a lot of trigger points in there. The, usually a trigger point for Quadrasal lumborum is the um, is L3. What is at the back shoe point for the ovaries, right? Right, you guys, you, you guys should know that. Right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot in a lot of the rectus spinae points along the, the uh, channels. You got the back shoe points for a lot of the different internal organs, right? You should be preaching to the choir here, right? 